So hello students, good evening. Today we will move on to study United Nations and International Diplomacy. This is the seventh chapter. As you know, this is the last class and uh, we will complete uh, chapter seven and chapter eight. Chapter seven and chapter eight are predominantly, uh, you know, small chapters, uh, mostly. Yeah, madam. yeah, you could expect it to uh, come for your exams in the form of short notes. You can expect short notes on these two chapters. So let us begin with the class. So United Nations and international diplomacy. So, so far, like for all the chapters, we have learned about what is the relationship between, uh, you know, international law and diplomacy. We learned about uh, how there are different diplomats, there's consulars, there are envoys, and what is their role in, uh, you know, really um, negotiating or communicating using diplomacy in the best interest of the nation or the country that they are representing. So the establishment of diplomatic relations, basically, as you have understood that, uh, I believe you have understood so far, is to uh, you know, establish diplomatic relations between all the nations or countries uh, so that you know, they could really promote or they can really promote mutual understanding and strengthen the friendship or the relationship between all the nations that are there across the globe and to, you know, develop cooperation between nations and so on. So all these go on by the guided principles that are enshrined in the United Nations Charter and in international law. So what is the role of UNO, that is the United Nations Organization in diplomacy? So of course, United Nations accomplishes this task of diplomacy, or rather I would say uses diplomacy as an instrument to prevent conflict. It helps parties in um, resolution of conflict, conflicts. It deploys, uh, you know, peacekeepers in the form of its envoys, and it creates a kind of a condition to allow peace to breed and to flourish. So it has different uh, wings, and you have heard of, I'm sure, Security uh, Council. So Security Council normally it, it takes charge when there is security concerns uh, for you know in, in the international arena. So today we will go forth and study in detail what is the exact nexus between United Nations and international diplomacy. This is a ch short chapter I'm reiterating. So diplomacy being an art of communication and negotiation certainly finds its place even in UN negotiations. In this fast paced world, which is continuously evolving, the role of United Nations organization is pivotal plumb line to maintain world order and peace. United Nations diplomacy is more of a private diplomacy. It can also be characterized as preventive diplomacy. We'll see what is preventive diplomacy when it sees through the lens of public diplomacy. In terms of diplomacy, the United Nations organization is a harmonious hub for resolving conflicts between member states and countries and settling international policies that needs to be complied with by member parties and parties who intend to partake in a particular alliance or an international deal. So compliance with certain international policies may become preemptively a pre-obligation or a condition precedent rather for engaging in any international deal. So think about a situation where a country wants to resolve a particular conflict or wants to engage, say, for example, in a particular trade deal. But there are certain principles that needs to be followed, certain international principles that needs to be followed, certain international principles that are devised by the UNO that can be a condition pre precedent or a kind of uh, a pre-obligation that needs to be complied with by any state party who wants to engage in any particular international deal. This is just by way of an example for you. So therefore, in terms of diplomacy, the United Nations organization is a harmonious hub for resolving conflicts between member states and countries and setting or devising international policies that has to be complied with by member parties, that is the member states and parties who intend to partake in a particular alliance or an international deal. So therefore compliance with certain international policies may become a condition precedent or it may become preemptively a pre-obligation for engaging in an international deal. 
ask me questions just in case you do not understand. So the UN Secretariat is headed by its Secretary General, who is also the Chief Administrative Officer of the United Nations. Now, who is the present Secretary General? The present Secretary General of the UNO is Antonio Guterro. He is from Portugal, so it is Antonio Guterro. So in the exercise of diplomatic role, the role of Secretary General is an, evo is an evolutionary one. So the UN Secret Secretary General is, he is normally the face of the UNO. He's a representative for advancing the policies of the organization and bringing about a consensus or a uniform agreement between state parties where all the state parties or member parties they agree to a particular decision that needs to be taken so it is a un secretary general who normally is the representative or he's uh, you know the chief administrative officer of the U a, a, a united nation organization and he tries to bring about a consensus between state parties uh, so diplomacy at the un can be called as a multi, I mean, they might engage in multilateral diplomacy. After five minutes, I will not be admitting any more students, please. So diplomacy at UNO is multilateral diplomacy, or rather we could also say that um, the UNO engages in multilateral diplomacy. So for the purpose of study, for this class, we will talk about two types of diplomacy with respect to UNO. So we, have, we can bifurcate it into multilateral diplomacy and preventive diplomacy. I'm repeating, in, with respect to UNO, for today's class or for this chapter, we will concentrate on multilateral diplomacy and preventive diplomacy in the UNO context. Now, diplomacy at the UNO is multilateral diplomacy, or it could engage in multilateral diplomacy. By the term itself, you would understand that there are different state parties would be involved. So it's multilateral. It's just not bilateral, which involves two states or two nations, but it is multilateral. There can be different nations, more than two nations that are involved in a particular diplomatic uh, arrangement or a program or a decision making process or in a in a, say a meeting or in a conference or whatever. So diplomacy at the UNO could be a multilateral diplomacy, which involves international discussion and drawing consensus between several state members or drawing agreements between or getting them to agree on a particular topic between several state members. Multilateral diplomacy means, oh sorry, meets, multilateral diplomacy meets crisis diplomacy. So what do we mean when we say that multilateral diplomacy meets crisis diplomacy? Whenever there is crisis, whenever there is a problem, of course, multilateral diplomacy plays a pivotal role when different nations come together to solve a particular crisis. So at present, of course, you see the Ukraine war. There are different nations which are trying to you know, intervene to solve the problem. India is a friend of Russia, as well as Ukraine, of course, but then India is considered to be a neutral party and is trying to intervene to resolve the, the dispute or the crisis between the, the present war crisis in Ukraine as well as in Russia. So there are other countries where I discussed, uh, I remember when I was teaching chapter two, the types of the forms of diplomacy, I've been talking about um, how different nations have been supporting, what is the role of different nations in supporting or in you know not supporting russia so multilateral diplomacy meets crisis diplomacy as well whereas where different uh, you know countries participate to resolve a particular problem or to resolve a particular crisis so the world is plunged into different problems such as conflicts between nations conflicts between different countries and so on this resolution to such problem is forged out of multilateral diplomacy when unified efforts are made to stifle issues and birth solutions resolutely both by the UNO and the state parties to a particular meeting or a conference on a particular subject. I'm repeating this, the resolution or the solutions to such problems is forged out or it comes out or is tapped out of multilateral diplomacy when there is unified efforts, when all of them unitedly, they you know, 
issue pressure or issue efforts to stifle issues, to uh, literally to blot out issues or stifle issues, to blot out problems or to stifle problems and to birth solutions or to give rise to solutions or to plan solutions or to strategize solutions resolutely, that is firmly both by the UNO and the participating state parties to a particular meeting or a conference on a particular subject. So in terms of preventive diplomacy, such diplomacy is argued by Article 99 of the United Nations Charter. So Article 99 outlines the role of the Secretary General to bring the threats to international peace and security to the attention of the UN Secretary Council. So it's a duty of the Secretary General to bring any threats that he you know, foresees or that has come uh, you know, to his notice, such threats to international peace and security, he should bring it to the attention of the UN Secretary Council. The UNO then collects information about the situation, builds connections and contacts to study the situation and sends its emissaries or envoys to the tension zone to observe the conflict closely and elicit reports. So they try to elicit uh, more information and prepare reports and they submit it to the UNO, to the UN Secretary General and the UN Secretary General can forward it to the UN Security Council or both the, you know, the Secretariat as well as the Secretary Security Council. It's not a Secretary Council, it is a Security Council. Okay, there's a typing error there. It's a Security Council. So both the bodies together will, you know, get together and resolve any conflict that may be there and uh, study the reports, whatever is prepared by the envoys or the emissaries that are really sent to the tension zone or to a particular area of conflict. I'm repeating, Article 99 outlines the role of the Secretary General to bring the threats to international peace and security to the attention of the UN Security Council, S-E-C-U-R-I-T-Y to the UN Security Council. The idea of preventive diplomacy was first used by Secretary General Dag Hammer, Agne Karl Hammerjold, who was Swedish and was considered the youngest ever to date to hold the post of the Secretary General way back in 1953. He was 47 years old when he took to the post and the UN recalls Dan Hammers stupendous role or a marvelous role or a remarkable role in preventing a nuclear confrontation over the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is a remarkable uh, uh, example of preventive diplomacy in the annals of United Nations. So this guy played a very important role in preventing a nuclear confrontation. And actually he was the one who, you know, really articulated the idea of preventive diplomacy. So this person, Secretary General Dag Hammer Agnikal Hammerjold was a Swedish diplomat. He was the youngest ever to hold the position of Secretary General of the United Nations way back in 1953. And he was the first person to articulate preventive diplomacy. In 1990s, Secretary General Butros Butros Ghali further furthered the practice or he you know, carried on with the practice of preventive diplomacy and he articulated it to resolve the war between Eritrea and Yemen. And he established the first ever preventive deployment of UN peacemakers. He prepared a, in a, a group of envoys and he was the first person to have this preventive envoys, a kind of a team. He sent them as a preventive team, preventive deployment of UN peacekeepers in Macedonia, that is a former Yugoslav Republic. Likewise, all the other Secretary Generals, such as Kofi Annan, Ban Ki-moon, until date, the UN Secretary Generals have been using, you know, preventive diplomacy to facilitate conflict prevention, aggravation, and resolution, including the present Secretary General. Who, what's the name of the present Secretary General, I said? What's his name? Antonio. Guterres. Very good. 
Thereby, diplomacy is a key instrument used by the UN for global governance. Let's run through this chapter again. So in chapter seven, we are learning about United Nations and international diplomacy. I'll repeat a little bit for those who have entered the class late. United Nations and international diplomacy. You can expect this to come for your short notes. Chapter seven and chapter eight are short chapters. So you can expect the short chapters to come for your exams in the form of short notes. So with respect to United Nations and international diplomacy, we have been discussing so far about the role of diplomatic relations in, uh, or the role of UNO in diplomatic relations. So diplomacy, as we know, is an art of communication and negotiation. And certainly in this fast-paced world, United Nations organization plays a, a pivotal role. It works as a plumb line to maintain world order and peace. Why we are calling it as a plumb line? Because it devises uh, various policies and it you know it has its UN Charter it works within the UN Charter and devises various policies which has to be complied with by the member states who are the member parties or the countries which are you know which have signed various treaties and have been part of different conventions or also by some other you know uh, countries in the world so they have different policies that needs to be complied with so it may be characterized also as using the tool of preventive diplomacy when you look at it through the lens of public diplomacy so in terms of diplomacy the united nations organization is a harmonious hub for resolving conflicts between member states and countries and settling international policies that need to be complied with by member parties and parties who intend to partake in a particular alliance or international deal so therefore compliance with certain international policies may become a condition precedent or preemptively a pre-obligation for engaging in any international deal so the present un secretary general as one of the student has uh, just reminded us is antonio gutero he is the present secretary general he is from portugal so in the exercise of diplomatic role, the role of the Secretary General is of an evolutionary one. It evolves, it's an evolutionary one. Why we are saying it is evolutionary? Because situation is not static, it is changing. It is inevitably changing. So it, it, it is evolving day by day. So it is an evolutionary one. He has to be prepared for every sort of situation and he has to exercise diplomacy in every situation and you know bring about a consensus between the countries in case there is any problem and you know try to lead them to um, you know comply with certain policies of the UNO and bring about peace so he plays a very important role he is the head of the UN secretariat he is also the chief administrative officer of the UNO when we are talking about UN diplomacy we can bifurcate and study it as uh, you know uh, bifurcate into multilateral diplomacy and preventive diplomacy and study it in two angles that is multilateral diplomacy and preventive diplomacy talking about un diplomacy when we when we are referring to multilateral diplomacy when you look at the term itself you understand that there it the the diplomacy or the participants are many in number or more than two so that's the reason we are saying multilateral if it is just two countries we would call it as bilateral so when we're talking about uno diplomacy at the uno is multilateral diplomacy which involves international discussion and drawing consensus or agreements between several member states multilateral diplomacy meets crisis diplomacy as well why we're saying it would meet crisis diplomacy because whenever there is a problem there are different nations who would come together to resolve a problem or in case there is a border dispute between say two nations say armenia and azerbaijan so these two nations should solve the problem but there are other countries who would try to support either of the country and you know persuade them to resolve the dispute or to resolve the problem so all this is done in alignment or in compliance with the policies that are set 
by the UNO, relevant policies, relevant policies in that particular direction, which is set by the UNO. So the world is plunged today into different problems and the world has always been in problems, of course. So the, the world is plunged into different problems such as conflicts between nations and so on. So the resolution to such problems is forged out or is tapped out of multilateral diplomacy when united efforts or unified efforts are made to stifle or to blot out issues and birth solutions or give solutions resolutely or firmly both by the UNO and the state parties to a particular meeting or a conference on a particular subject. Next is preventive diplomacy. Now, with respect to preventive diplomacy, I, I said earlier when we are, we were, I was talking, I'm, I'm in dealing with um, slide five, there was this person, Secretary General Dag Hammer, Agne Karl Hammer, Hammerjold, who was Swedish and he was the youngest ever uh, Secretary General who was appointed way back in 1953. So he was the one who you know, articulated or also propounded this concept of preventive diplomacy and he utilized it, especially in preventing a nuclear confrontation over the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is, of course, a remarkable example of preventive diplomacy registered in the annals of United Nations, in the records of United Nations. In 1919, Secretary General Butros Butros Ghali, he furthered or he carried on the practice of preventive diplomacy and articulated it to resolve the war between Eritrea and Yemen and he established the first ever preventive deployment of UN peacemakers or peacekeepers in Macedonia that is the former Yugoslav Republic. Likewise all the other Secretary Generals such as Kofi Annan, Ban Ki-moon and till date the present uh, UN Secretary General is also using the preventive diplomacy tool to facilitate conflict prevention aggravation and resolution. So therefore, diplomacy is a key instrument which is used by the UN for global governance. Next, we will move on to the next chapter, according as pause. So it's not necessary that the courts would actively use diplomacy while adjudicating matters. However, international courts would use diplomacy as a means of legitimization through non-judicial tools of legal training, international seminars, and conferences. So through such conferences, the non-referential narratives about international court processes and outcomes are communicated efficiently, wherein the participant, participants and the public gain insight into the peripheral processes of the international courts. So for what does uh, international court use diplomacy or how does it use diplomacy? It uses diplomacy through the non-judicial tools of legal training, international seminars and conferences. So this point can be made clear, like with the subsequent example we'll be giving through the other point, it is connected, of course. On the other hand, protection of immunity and privileges granted to diplomats are some of the matters that come up for adjudication before the international courts. For example, in 1979, the United States Embassy in Tehran, this Iran, was attacked by an armed Iranian mob who incarcerated or detained 60 US diplomats. And means they detained them, they locked them up, 60 US diplomats, and seized the offices of the diplomatic missions. Who did that? An armed Iranian mob. It was not a legitimate, uh, you know, group. It was not a legal group. It was an armed Iranian mob, which, you know, attacked the diplomatic mission and detained 60 US diplomats way back in 1979. So this was an illegal act and an offense. So the Iran government under international protocols was obligated to secure the release of the US detainees inter alia, but it failed to appropriately respond and intervene in the matter. It did not interfere in the matter. Consequently, the US Department of State instituted legal action against Iran at the International Court of Justice. The US primary, primarily, primarily contended that 
Iran contended, the spelling is wrong there, US primarily contended that Iran blatantly violated the diplomatic relations treaty and the consular relations and that Iran failed to safeguard the US diplomatic mission and the diplomats. So Iran, on the other hand, what Iran did, even Iran did not file their pleading or the response before the International Court of Justice. Now let's see what International Court of Justice held. So the International Court of Justice ruled that in this case, Iran has, its, its judgment was that Iran has positively violated its obligations towards the US. Iran is accountable for these violations. It is held responsible for these violations. The government of Iran should release the US detainees that is, those who were incarcerated, those who were locked up illegally. Next, US diplomats or consular cannot be subject to any judicial proceedings in Iran as per the, you know, the privilege that they enjoy. And Iran should compensate the US for all the injury and the damage caused to the US. So this is one of the examples that I have given when, with respect to uh, how the ICJ or the International Court of Justice, the doors of the International Court of Justice can be knocked by any of these nations and how it has got the jurisdiction to handle matters related to diplomatic envoys or diplomats when it comes to, um, you know, degradation or, you know, um, you know, um, when it comes to not giving their rights or when it comes to, um, you know, attacking their privileges or their rights. So yet another aspect is of judicial diplomacy used by the courts of international jurisdiction in perplexities of cross-jurisdictional matter. Like for example, say there is a family case that is filed in London court. It could be a normal court, a London court, by a couple where the man is from Africa, say, and the woman is from some other country, say from India, and the child, children are born and brought up in London. So this is a complicated situation. So what kind of a law will the will the court use. So this is a paradoxical situation. And this again calls for judicial diplomacy where different laws and international instruments need to be looked at in the pursuit of adjudication. So this is a shortest chapter and this is all about judicial diplomacy and international relations. With this, we complete the syllabus. So chapter one was introduction to international law and diplomacy. You've got your PPT, you've got your notes, all, I mean, all of it is uploaded in the Google Classroom. Types and the forms of diplomacy. This is a very, very important chapter. When any question is asked on any of the chapters, I want you to first begin it with definition of diplomacy. What is diplomacy? how it is connected with international law in one line, and then you can continue with whatever the question is. You'll have to write exhaustive answers for your exams. You know, I've already sent, given you the question paper pattern. Okay, the second chapter is types and forms of diplomacy. As I said, this is a very important chapter, examination point of view, final examination point of view. Ethics, morality, culture, and diplomacy. You can take this as well as an important chapter. Bargaining power and diplomacy functions of a diplomat, diplomatic conferences, protocols and procedures, chapter five, chapter six, Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, chapter seven, United Nations and International Diplomacy, and chapter eight, Judicial Diplomacy and International Relations. So last two chapters, you can always expect a short note. And again, even Vienna Convention is absolutely important. And um, yeah, because it's an, it's an important topic. So you can expect probably a question on that as well. So you got the question paper pattern. So that is it. So this is the end of the syllabus. Do you have another question? Do you have any other question? Well, now uh, regarding the, in case we disconnect, we, we 